Good morning. Good morning, everyone. This is um, HIPAA or FERPA, School Health Information Sharing in California. That's the topic of our webinar today. Um, we're so pleased to have you all join us and also very honored to have Rebecca Goodman with us as our resident expert. Um, the goals that we have for today are um, to provide all attendees with a basic understanding of the two laws that govern information sharing um, around students and um, patients, HIPAA and FERPA, to provide examples of some ways that schools and healthcare providers have shared information appropriately and legally, and to introduce the new online primer that hopefully answers all these questions in more depth for you to reference. Some really quick housekeeping, um, the, everyone is automatically on mute, so we will not be able to hear you. There's actually, um, it's not possible for us to turn on speakers for everyone. However, you can type questions into the chat or the Q&A box, and we will be monitoring those and collecting those. Um, and we are recording this webinar, and we'll post both this webinar as well as a link to the online primer on our website within the next couple days. So if you have other questions and need to follow back up, you'll have the opportunity to access that then. Um, as a quick introduction, my name is Amy Ranger. I'm the Director of Programs at the California School-Based Health Alliance. Um, and I'll just be moderating and facilitating today's um, webinar. Our expert who will be presenting is Rebecca Gudeman from the National Center for Youth Law. Um, she is the author of the primer and has been a longtime friend of School-Based Health Centers um, has really been the champion of how school health centers and healthcare providers and school employees can navigate these tricky waters of information sharing. So we're so grateful for her work over the years and so grateful to have her here today. For those of you who might not be familiar with us, the California School-Based Health Alliance is um, a nonprofit organization covering the um, entire state of California, supporting school-based health centers um, that are already existing. There are currently 268 school health centers in California, and our job is to help those school health centers do the best work possible and sustain their work, um, as well as to help new school health centers open. There's um, more centers opening every week, and we're thrilled to help um, help school partners and, and healthcare partners open new school health centers everywhere that they're needed. So um, we do a lot of different kind of technical assistance and training, and we really want to serve the field the best we can, so if there's specific needs that you have from us, by all means let us know. Um, and we are a membership organization. Um, many of you all are already members either individually or as organizations, but if you're not, we highly encourage you to do so. Um, it does give a discounted registration cost for our upcoming conference, which I'll talk a little bit more about at the end, um, as well as additional tools and resources and technical assistance um, that we're able to offer for free. So if you're not already a member, please think about becoming one. Um, and I will just quickly say, in case folks drop off before the end, that our conference, our annual conference this year will be in May in Redondo Beach, and Rebecca will be there in person doing this uh, version of this training in person. So we're really excited about the conference and hope that you all can join us. And I will go ahead and pass it over now to Rebecca. Thanks so much, Amy, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I am going to be covering a lot of material in our short hour, um, but I do encourage you to um, submit questions through the question box. I may end up waiting until the end to address them, but if I can, I'll try to address them as we go through. Um, and we have reserved some time at the end for questions, so we should have time to, to walk through everything. But please feel free to con submit them as we move through in case you um, have something burning or you uh, are worried about forgetting it before we get to the end. Um, I'm sure everyone on this call, I'm confident that everyone on this uh, call uh, has a really good understanding of why information sharing is important, but it can be really helpful sometimes to ground these conversations in real stories. So I just wanted to quickly start with John's story. John is obviously not the real name, but this is a real person. Um, John was in third grade, and his teacher noticed that he had started to really seem more distracted than usual and was fidgeting and having a hard time focusing in class. Um, and luckily, their school had a local nonprofit that was coming once a week to campus to provide mental health counseling. So she made a referral, and John and his family did uh, connect and begin to receive services. 
um, the counselor discovered that there had been some recent loss in their family, and John was now uh, really having trouble and and fears related to um, being scared about losing some of his other family members um, that had been impacting his sleep, anxiety. Um, So they were really, it was a great thing that they were able to connect. They were making some progress in therapy. And then the teacher who had made that referral reached out to the counselor to ask if there was anything she could do. And the counselor had to say, I can't tell you anything and said, I can't even tell you if he's coming in for services, which made the teacher feel um, less uh, empowered, let's put it that way. Um, And I'm sure that that's an all too familiar um, kind of scenario, and that's exactly what we're trying to avoid when we bring schools and healthcare together. We're really trying to get the best of both worlds. Um, This is an obvious question, but so much valuable information that a health provider might be able to um, get from schools, whether it's about behavior in class, about attendance, about grades, um, and the other way are, uh, around that um, the school could really benefit with a collaboration with a health provider, understanding um, it, why somebody may be sleepy in the afternoons or what uh, what what their behavior might mean and how to help support someone to really make the best uh, learning outcomes. Um, And sometimes when we start digging into these kinds of stories, folks sort of say, well, goodness, why don't we just share everything? Um, And so I'd like to just come back and remind us why, separate and apart from laws, uh, privacy does matter. It does have a, a value. All of us do have expectations of privacy for certain information in our lives, um, we hope that folks will be sensitive to whether it's our friends or, or professionals we work with. And we actually also know that protecting privacy can improve outcomes. Um, there have been a number of studies in the clinical setting, particularly with adolescents, that say the ability to provide a, a mantle of confidentiality in a clinical setting can impact whether or not a, a teen is willing to even come in for care in the first place, Um, if they do walk through that door, whether or not they're going to disclose to that health provider what is going on and and how much is going on, and it will even uh, impact uh, follow-up and whether they're willing to come back and see you. Um, So we, we know that privacy is actually also critically important to our ultimate goals as well. Um, One of the things I like to say, you know, so often we hear, I can't because of HIPAA or I can't because of HERPA, HERPA, (laughs) FERPA. Um, No law is absolute. Every single confidentiality law out there has a general structure. And, yes, in in a few situations, there's going to be some information that's really protected, but most of these laws have exceptions and have mechanisms to share information. So what we really need to do is just make sure we understand what those are. And rather than thinking of information exchange and privacy as sort of this tug of war, we find that balance so that we can achieve both goals. So with all that said, what we said that we're going to do today is give a basic um, overview of HIPAA and health information confidentiality. Then we'll cover FERPA and school information confidentiality. And then we'll talk about sort of where that comes together when healthcare comes to a school site. Um, Because this is a a sort of one-hour overview, we're not going to be able to get into a lot of depth. That's why we really wanted to make sure everyone is aware of this primer. Um, The first edition of this primer had been out for quite a few years, but we recently updated it. The second edition is now available as of late 2018, and you can find it both on the website for the National Center for Youth Law and also um, on the website um, for the School Health Association Alliance. Um, All right, so let's start with confidentiality and disclosure of health information. And here we're talking about healthcare providers, clinicians sharing information with third parties. Uh, Oftentimes we call this HIPAA, but it's really important to know that there's actually a number of laws that apply in this case. 
HIPAA is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. It's a federal law, and it establishes some minimum standards for confidentiality and disclosure of health records. Um, but what HIPAA says is if your state has its own medical confidentiality laws and those laws in any way provide greater confidentiality protection, then you should follow your state law. Um, California is one of those states that has some pretty comprehensive medical confidentiality laws on the books. Um, two of the big acts are the Confidentiality of Medical Information Act, which covers physical health records, and many, if not most, mental health records, and then the lanterman Petrie short Act, which covers records for, like, inpatient mental health hospitalization and some other uh, mental health developmental disability records. There are some other laws as well that might protect specific uh, types of information, like substance abuse records or HIV, AIDS-related records. Um, we're not going to focus on those. These three are the big ones to, to understand when you're just trying to get a general sense of what are the rules around uh, sharing health information. And uh, even though as shorthand I'm going to end up saying HIPAA, I just want to make sure you understand that what we're talking about is HIPAA integrated with California law. And that's why the next slides are very specific to California uh, folks in other states may not follow exactly the same rules because we have our own state laws um, integrated in here. Um, so who does HIPAA apply to? It applies to covered entities and business associates. And really that means healthcare providers, health plans, healthcare uh, clearing houses uh, who transact information uh, electronically. That is going to be almost everyone but there may be a few exceptions. And if you want more details on what covered entity means and who is covered by HIPAA, you can look in the primer and we've got a lot more information, including uh, definitions of business associates. Business associates typically would be like your lawyer or your auditor or your insurance, the, the folks that help you manage your insurance billing, folks that may need to use or transmit information you've collected at your clinic, um, but it's part of doing the business of your clinic, really as a, a, um, almost a, a third arm for uh, your agency. The general rule for confidentiality under HIPAA and California law is that healthcare providers must protect the confidentiality of personal health information, uh, identifiable health information. And as a basic standard, you must have a signed authorization in order to share protected health information. I use the word authorization instead of consent because consent, sometimes we think about consent to treatment, sort of what gets someone in the door. And the person who consents to health care may not always be the same person who is has permission to sign a release of information. So we'll use the word authorization to keep those two things separate. Um, so even though our general rule is we need a signed authorization, there are exceptions that allow a health provider to share information even without a signed release in place. And we'll talk about some of those in just a second. But I wanted to uh, just go back and reiterate this key point. You can always share information if there's a valid written authorization to release. Um, otherwise, you can only share if an exception is in place. Um, so that release should always be your go-to when you're thinking about how do we make this kind of exchange happen. It's not always possible, but that's always something to keep at the top of your mind. Um, in order for a release to be valid, it needs to comply with both HIPAA and California law. And both of those put certain obligations, certain things that a, a release form has to have in order to be valid. Um, here's a couple examples. It needs an expiration date. Uh, it needs to describe the information that's going to be disclosed in a meaningful way. Um, it cannot have what's called a compound signature, meaning that someone is agreeing to multiple things with just one signature. Um, and note, it needs to be in 14-point font. That's one of the things that's really easy to 
uh, get wrong because we're all trying to jam things onto one piece of paper, but that's what California law requires. It also needs to include a number of notices. Um, there's a lot more information on this in the primer, but it needs to explain how um, someone could revoke a release of information, um, that you have a right to refuse, et cetera. Um, this is just an example. I've changed the name, obviously, on top, but this is a real form that we found in use, and I'd just like to point out a couple ways that this would not comply with HIPAA. Um, so, for one, it doesn't include a, an expiration date. Um, it doesn't describe in much detail the, the information that is going to be released, um, by whom. Um, it just says necessary information uh, under release of information. Um, it includes both a consent to treatment and a release of information that would be signed with the same signature. That's what we mean by compound signatures. So if there were a signature line for consent to treatment and a signature line for release of information, that would be okay. But since they've com combined the two, that would violate um, uh, the law. So uh, I'm not going to go into all the other ways this may or may not work, but this is a, a simple thing to make sure that you've got in place and there's more information in the primer. Um, who signs the authorization to release information under HIPAA and California law? What California law says is that the minor patient must sign if records relate to services the minor consented to or could have consented to um, under the law. Um, so what are those that would be anything related to pregnancy, family planning, contraception, um, sexually transmitted disease, uh, testing, treatment for someone 12 or older, mental health counseling for someone who's 12 or older. Um, there's others. You can find a full list of minor consent laws um, on our website, teenhealthlaw.org, if you're not familiar with all of those. Um, but that uh, those laws are an important link to who signs um, the authorizations. In other cases, it's the minor's legal representative who signs. In many cases, that's going to be their parent, but it may be a legal guardian, uh, like a grandparent uh, or another third party who has uh, legal custody of the young person. Um, so just two quick examples. Sylvia is 16. She's pregnant and receiving prenatal care at a community clinic. Her health provider recommends she speak to her school in order to help the administration understand what support she needs in class and so that she can get the appropriate uh, uh, excuses. Um, for example, one of the big ones we've heard is just making sure that you can go to the bathroom when you need to because so many uh, teachers have strict rules on being released during class time um, to go to the bathroom. Um, may the health provider talk to the school based on Sylvia's uh, oral verbal permission? Well, this is a community clinic that works under HIPAA. That means the general rule is you need uh, a signed release in order to share information with a third party. The school would be considered a third party. Um, who would sign that release? Because pregnancy and prenatal care is a minor consent service in California, Sylvia would be able to sign that release. Now, Sylvia herself could simply go to the school and, and share this information on her own. She's not required to comply with HIPAA, but if she wants her health provider to be able to communicate with the school directly, uh, they would need to have that in place. Another case, Joey. Nine, receiving mental health therapy from a private cl clinician. His parents want the therapist to talk to Joey's homeroom school teacher in order to help the teacher understand what support Joey needs in class. Um, this may be part of an IEP process. This may simply be a one-on-one -on -one conversation. May the therapist talk to the teacher. Um, again, this is a situation where the general rule says we need written authorization before the therapist can communicate with that third party with the school. Um, in this case, because Joey is nine, and this is mental health therapy, 
his parents or legal guardian would sign that release, and then the uh, therapist would be able to com- communicate with the teacher based on whatever the, the release says in terms of what information can be shared with whom and for how long. Uh, now, as I mentioned earlier, we can't always rely on releases. There's a number of exceptions in the law that do allow for uh, health providers to share information even without a release in place. Um, there's a lot of them. I'm just going to mention a few that seem to be uh, come up particularly frequently in the school-based health context. Um, so first one I'm going to introduce with a case. This is Liam. Liam and his parents visit Nancy Nurse to discuss the headaches he's been having more and more frequently. Liam's parents mentioned that he just started taking some new allergy medication that prescribed by Patty Provider at a local clinic, but they can't remember what that medication name is. So while they're in the exam room, Nancy Nurse calls Patty Provider to ask for the name of the prescription. What, if anything, may Patty tell Nancy Nurse on the phone? Well, our general rule says that before any information can be disclosed, since it's covered by HIPAA and California state law, uh, our general rule would be we need a written release. But there is an exception in our in HIPAA and state law that allow healthcare providers to share information with other healthcare providers uh, without need of a release. Um, if that is for the purpose of diagnosis or treatment of a patient. And that's everything but psychotherapy notes um, under the CMIA. Lanterman Petri Short, which again is about records of an inpatient hospitalization, uh, mental health records, um, that actually has a similar exception. It allows sharing outpatient information and communication between qualified professionals and even disclosure of inpatient records if that disclosure is with the professional who is going to be treating that patient on um, outside of the hospital setting. Um, so this is a really valuable exception if we're trying to make sure that, mul- that someone who's seen multiple providers can be connected and have continuity of healthcare services. Um, the one thing to note is that this is not a mandatory uh, exception. A health pr- provider is allowed to share but not required to share. And some providers may decide that even though they know they're allowed to do this under the law, this is not something that for whatever reasons, whether it's ethics or clinic policy, that they want to uh, take advantage of and they still may want to seek a client client release in order to share. Um, Another exception that people ask about a lot is the emergency exception. Um, This exception says that even despite our general rule about keeping information protected, um, if a provider believes disclosure of information is necessary to prevent or lessen a serious and imminent threat to the health or safety of a reasonably foreseeable victim or victims, um, and that disclosure is made to someone who's reasonably able to prevent or lessen the threat, then that disclosure can be made without need of a, a release. So let's look at what that means in in real world. Um, So here's sort of an extreme invented example, luckily. Uh, Miranda's 15. She's been seeing a therapist at a local after-school program that's subject to HIPAA and and California Medical of Information Act. Usually anxious and depressed, Miranda today seems much calmer and more peaceful. Asked what's going on, she says she just gave her prized stuffed animal to her sister and left all her money under her mom's pillow. She's suddenly feeling happy, but she's spending a lot of time talking about a friend who just died, and at the end of their session, she thanks her therapist for trying to help her and wishes her well. Now, the therapist rightly is is quite concerned about Miranda and is wondering if there's anything she can do. Um, Since Miranda is seeing her as a 15-year-old under minor consent, this is typically a something where Miranda's written consent would be necessary, a written authorization in order to share information with third parties, um, even to share with her parents. But in this case, the therapist is really thinking that Miranda might be planning something desperate. And so if you look at the emergency exception, it actually gives the therapist, if in good faith, the therapist believes that she needs to disclose information to protect 
Miranda from a serious and imminent threat to her health or safety, the therapist can make a disclosure to anyone the therapist believes is reasonably able to prevent or lessen that threat. That may be parents, that may be the police, that may be uh, an aunt or a friend, or it, it, it's really up to the therapist to decide in that situation what is going to be the best way to make sure that Miranda is safe. Um, another exception um, to HIPAA is the child abuse reporting exception. Uh, even though the general rule is we can't disclose, uh, California law requires uh, anyone who is a mandated reporter to disclose information when they reasonably suspect abuse or neglect. And this is an exception under HIPAA that allows you as a mandated reporter to make a report to the appropriate parties. It authorizes disclosure to law enforcement or to child welfare, um, but the key is that just because that report has been made, it doesn't mean that information is suddenly no longer protected by HIPAA. So the exception allows you to share with those two entities, but it doesn't allow you to share with others. Um, so in a case like Miranda, if she's receiving minor consent services um, and the therapist normally wouldn't be able to, to provide information to parents if, rather than suicide, Miranda disclosed abuse, the therapist could make a child abuse report, but they wouldn't be able to then call the parents and say, we've made a child abuse report on Miranda. Okay, so that was a really quick overview of HIPAA. Again, there's a lot more detail in the primer, and please feel free to send in any questions if I went through anything too fast. But now what I'd like to do is move on and talk about FERPA and disclosure of school records, information that might be in a school file. Um, just like HIPAA, there's both federal and state law when it comes to confidentiality and privacy of uh, records being held at a school. FERPA um, is our federal law, and we do have a California education code that says uh, that records need to be protected. But unlike HIPAA, in this case, FERPA preempts state law. So if there's ever a conflict between California law and FERPA, people are supposed to follow FERPA. So what we do here in California is going to look pretty much like what happens in other states because FERPA ends up controlling things. What is FERPA? It's the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, and it was passed back in the 1970s really with two goals, to protect the privacy of education records but also to ensure that parents can access their child's education records, which is important uh, for us, as we'll see coming um, later on. Uh, who must comply with FERPA? Um, educational agencies and institutions need to comply with FERPA, and that means any public or private agency which is receiving funds through the Federal Department of Education um, and really, if you think about it, that's money coming from the feds down into the State Department of Education, and it's going to mean most all public schools. It means um, school districts, county boards of education, et cetera. So it covers both the schools that are directly providing services, but also agencies authorized to direct and control schools. Um, it also covers records um, created by anyone acting for or employed by a, an educational agency like a school or a district, and it can include organizations that contract with an educational agency, as we'll talk about in a little bit. What is an education record? FERPA protects education records, and that's records, filings, recordings, or any other way to document or uh, record information that is directly related to a student and is maintained by that agency or by a person who is working for that agency. Um, education record can include health information. So for example, part of an education record may be immunization records or tests or evaluations that were done as part of an IEP. Um, those are 
part of the education record and treated in the same way as we might treat attendance grades or any other information in that education record. FERPA doesn't make a distinction um, for health records. Now there is some information that is not part of an education record. Um, personal impressions, oral communications, things that haven't been documented are not under FERPA. So that casual comment or conversation in the hallway with a student that's never written down in a file, that's not under FERPA. Um, or your sense that um, somebody is seeming a little sad or off today, um, that is not something you know that you're putting down in your record that's not going to be considered an education record subject to FERPA. What also is not part of FERPA are records of instructional, supervisory, or administrative personnel that are kept in the sole possession of the person who wrote that record or created it and it, that are not made accessible to anybody else. Um, sometimes this is called a sole possession record. What's also not part of the FERPA education record are records on students 18 or older made by a health provider and used only in connection with provision of medical treatment. So as soon as they're used to bill or to be shared with another uh, uh, third party, they, they become part of the FERPA record. Um, and there's a lot more about that in the primer. All right, so what is a rule? In the same way as sort of like HIPAA, FERPA prohibits educational agencies from releasing personally identifiable information from an education record without written consent. And just like HIPAA, there are certain elements that a, a consent form needs to include in order to be valid. There are also, just like HIPAA, exceptions in FERPA that allow schools and education agencies to share information sometimes even when they don't have that consent in place. But just like we did with HIPAA, I'm going to hammer home that you can always share information if there's a valid written authorization. Otherwise, you can only share if an exception allows or requires it. So bringing it back to the let's always look at that release option first. All right, who signs a release of records when we're talking about education records? What FERPA says is that a parent signs for students who are under 18 years old, and the student signs if the student is 18 or older. There is no minor consent, there is no time that a minor, someone under 18, would sign a release of their educational records. Who is considered a parent? FERPA defines parent as a natural parent, guardian, or someone acting as a parent. And notably, most districts will have local policy that defines what parent means in your district. So who that includes may be spelled out in a lot more specificity based on the school district that you're in. Um, so make sure that you're always checking uh, your local policies. Now, as we said, great if we can get a release, we can't always there are exceptions in FERPA that allow or require release. Again, there's many, so I'm just going to flag a couple. Um, the first is uh, allows disclosure for legitimate educational interests to other school officials. So school officials can share information from that education record with other school officials in the same school as long as that other person has a legitimate educational interest in the information. For this purpose, legitimate educational interest means that the one professional needs that information in order to fill, fulfill his or her professional responsibility. Um, but again, this is a place where local policy is going to play an important role in, in defining how much can be shared and with whom. School official means teachers, principals, other school staff. Um, so this is how one teacher can share information with another teacher or how a principal can share information with a school nurse, for example, um, as long as there's an educational, uh, a le a legitimate educational interest in the information. Um, but one of the things that sometimes folks ask is, can this ever be used um, to allow schools to share information with a contractor or a consultant? 
Um, and the Federal Department of Education has said that this can be used to share information with a contractor as long as that contractor is performing a service or a function that the school or the district would do for itself using employees if, if the contractor weren't there, that there really is a legitimate educational interest in that disclosure. If the contractor is under direct control of the school in how they use education records and that they're complying with FERPA. So what does this mean in the real world? An example from the Federal Department of Education, um, real example, Clark County School District in, uh, wanted to use an online um, education uh, program, uh, uh, sorry, electronic records database called Edline. Um, they uh, it allowed Clark County School District to put all of their records online and Edline would control access, would make sure that they were updated, would make sure that certain people had access to certain things and other people didn't have access um, to other things. Um, and they wanted to make sure this is a third-party vendor and they were worried that sharing their records with that third-party vendor would violate FERPA. And what the Federal Department of Education said is, look, as long as you have a contract with them, um, they're performing an inst institutional service that you would have to do otherwise because you do have to hold your records and release them and control access. Um, they're performing a legitimate educational interest function because they're simply need, they need access just to put them up. Um, they're not prying through it for other reasons. And your contract is requiring them to comply with FERPA and you're controlling what they do with them. And therefore, that kind of contract um, is okay, comes under this uh, legitimate educational interest exception, and you don't need to have a release from every single parent to use this. Another exception is the directory information exception. It allows uh, disclosure without need of a release. Parents must be given the option of opting out of directory release at least once a year. Um, and districts must adopt their own local policies about what that re uh, giving parents that option, what directory information includes. Um, but this can be an important thing to keep in mind too. I, it would allow a school, for example, to share a list of uh, everyone enrolled in that school with a county department, for example, if they're trying to coordinate services. Um, just like HIPAA, there is an emergency exception in FERPA that allows uh, a school to disclose to appropriate parties in connection with a health or safety emergency if knowledge of that uh, information is necessary to protect the health or safety of the student or other individual. So if we think back to Miranda in the same way, if this were a school-employed counselor whose records are subject to FERPA and that school-employed counselor was also uh, concerned and wanted to understand um, their discretion to share information and with whom they could share, um, this exception in FERPA allows that therapist to share with appropriate parties if they believe that sharing with that person will help protect the health or safety of the student or individual. So again, it's a pretty broad exception and it's important to remember that those are in place uh, for emergency situations. Um, just like HIPAA, there's an exception in FERPA that allows you to comply with your mandated reporting duties um, and you would not be violating FERPA by doing so. Okay, so that's our overview of FERPA. What do we do if we've got a school-based health clinic? We know that outside... So yes? Great timing, mean, just a 10-minute warning before Q&A. Okay, great. Um, and I do see there's some questions coming in. I'm just going to dive through the, these last slides and then we'll get to those questions. Um, so we know our outside uh, hospitals, community clinics are covered by HIPAA. We know that the school districts, the schools, and school employees like teachers are covered by FERPA. Uh, or what about a school-based health or mental health program? So the first thing I want to flag, um, sometimes folks wonder if it's possible to be under both HIPAA and FERPA. HIPAA explicitly states that its rules do not apply to health information held in an education record subject to FERPA. 
So if FERPA applies, HIPAA does not. So that's the first thing. Second, now this is a page from the primer. Just wanted, It's going to be impossible for you to read right now, but wanted to flag that it's there for you. And the first and most important question on this graphic is, uh, when you're trying to understand whether a health provider is subject to HIPAA or FERPA, is asking, does that health provider meet the definition of educational agency employee or agent? Um, there was joint guidance issued by both the Federal Department of Health and Human Services and Federal Department of Education trying to help folks answer this question. Uh, there's a lot more information in the primer, but what it comes down to is a case-by-case -case assessment. And some of the factors that they would look at are operational and administrative control, who's controlling the health services being provided, the services and functions being provided, uh, uh, are these traditional school nurse nursing duties being provided, or does it go well beyond what a school typically would provide, for example, um, and financing, just three variables that will play into that call, judgment call. There's some examples in the primer to see how the federal government sort of weighs those. Um, but one of the questions that sometimes comes up is basically, this is hard. Can't we just designate ourselves either HIPAA or FERPA in a contract and leave it at that? And the answer is not really, because if all of those legal factors that I mentioned on that previous slide make it clear that someone is either subject to FERPA or HIPAA, you can't change that by contract. Um, for example, a school couldn't just sign a contract saying our, our education records on our pupils are not FERPA. Um, we just can't do that. The law wouldn't let us. But it, it can be helpful to address confidentiality in an MOU to make sure that everybody is on the same page about who's covered by what and what that means. Um, and that's why I have in bold and underlined it is so important to work with legal counsel to help figure out who is under what, what those factors say, and move forward with clear understanding. Um, some of the practical implications, um, whether you're FERPA or HIPAA, parent access. As I said before, there is no such thing as minor consent under FERPA. Um, and depending on the types of health care services being provided, the age of the clients and students, that may make a, a big difference uh, in terms of uh, protection and service delivery. Um, access by other school staff or other medical providers. Records under FERPA, a lot more open for other school staff, which can be a great thing or maybe something that um, would concern you depending on what kind of services you're provided or what might be in that record. Um, administrative rules, some examples of that. If you are actually under HIPAA, you do need to provide notices of privacy practices. You need to make sure that your release form complies with HIPAA. There's discl certain disclosure log rules, um, record keeping rules. And in the same way with FERPA, there are certain disclosure log rules Release forms need to comply with FERPA, annual notices that need to be made. You need to make sure you know what your local policies say. So um, the, the HIPAA FERPA question not only will control who and with whom information can be shared, it actually will also impact some of the day-to-day -day administrative stuff that goes on. Um, okay, I'm going to do, I think, uh, one case, and then we can start looking at some of the uh, questions that have come in and open it up to more questions. So in this case, 11-year-old Andre has been receiving mental health counseling at his school-based health center. Clinician believes Andre is progressing but wants to see if the progress is translating into better behavior in the classroom and better academic results. She asks to see the grades and class reports on Andre. So our question is, um, could the mental health counselor access those records, whether they're in an online system or in a paper file? Um, now, the first question is whether this mental health uh, program at the school-based health center, whether their records are subject to FERPA or HIPAA. If they're subject to HIPAA, our general rule says we need a release in order to uh, uh, oh, wait, sorry, I'm, I 
jumping ahead because I was starting to talk about what the clinician can share with the teacher. So let's talk about that, and then we'll come back to what the school can share with the clinician. If the, um, if the clinician is subject to HIPAA, then the, clinician, the general rule is we would need a release um, signed in this case, because Andre is only 11, it would have to be signed by a legal guardian or parent, um, allowing disclosure to um, the school or to teachers. Um, if we think about any exceptions in HIPAA that might allow the uh, counselor to disclose information under HIPAA without a, a release in place, um, the treatment exception wouldn't apply to allow the the counselor to share with a teacher, the um, emergency exception wouldn't apply. Um, so they would really need to have that uh, release in place, but that's something that they could do um, up front when they're first engaging in services if they think that that's going to be a really valuable way to coordinate between the school and the um, school-based health clinic. Um, now, if the clinician wants to get records from the school and is subject to HIPAA, let's think about what uh, the school can do. The school records are under FERPA. FERPA in general would require a written release in order to share with third parties. There is an exception in FERPA that allows the school to share with other school officials for uh, if they have legitimate educational interests uh, in the records. Um, so in that sense, if this were a mental health counselor who was a school employee and who was who whose records were also subject to FERPA, that might be something where the counselor could go in and get that the information that they're seeking about academics and attendance without needing a release in place. But because the school based health center is under HIPAA and this is not someone who is a school official um, in order to exchange in both directions, they would need uh, to have a release in place. Uh, okay, I'm going to pause there because I know a number of questions have come in. So I'm going to start going to look at those, and I also welcome folks to uh, send in any additional questions at this point. Um, Okay, let's see. Uh, I'm wondering, Amy, if you can, there's so many, I'm wondering if you can help me. Um, I can summarize for you. I think I okay, have, I, great. I have three here, so we'll start with those and then maybe um, folks, if they're sending them directly to you, can post them to me or to the group and I'll summarize them. The first one I think is just an overview um, of the slide with the little decision-making tree because someone was asking clinical records on for services provided by the school-based health centers, do those fall under HIPAA or FERPA? Um, wait, could you repeat that one more time? If clinical That's just sort of the basic am I HIPAA or FERPA. It's if there's clinical records that are services provided by a school-based health center, would that fall under HIPAA or FERPA? Yep, and your answer is correct. The million-dollar question is whether that school-based health center, they would have to walk through this decision tree to decide whether they're under HIPAA or FERPA. So does that that um, school-based health center uh, in some way fall under the definition of an educational agency or employee of an agency or an agent of one, and they would look at these three variables, among others, to decide that. Um, if you go to the primer, there is a bit more information on each of the questions you see on this decision tree to help you make that judgment call. Um, but oftentimes you are making a judgment call. In some cases, it can be really obvious. Um, but take a look at the primer and the case examples in the primer. Great. That's the $64,000 question that everyone has right. to answer for. Um, the next one is a FERPA-specific question about do we need a release to share information to other stakeholders that are not school officials during a SARB hearing, so an attendance-related yeah. hearing? Yeah, that's a really great question, a really common one, because more and more we're doing multidisciplinary team meetings. Um, there is no exception in FERPA that explicitly authorizes disclosure of education records to third parties who, are, who don't meet that definition of school official that we showed. 
Um, so you may need a release in place. Um, but that would be the question. If they don't meet this definition of school official, um, then uh, they would they would need a release in place in order to share with those outside agencies or professionals. Great, great. And then the next one I have is, um, what information about outside mental health services can be recorded in the school database? So um, the, as an example, the school would like to record that a student was receiving mental health services by a school-based provider in the FERPA covered database. All right, so in that case, I'm going to assume that the school-based provider is subject to HIPAA um, because, of course, if this was a school employee, that would change our answer. So if this is a school-based health center that is subject to HIPAA, HIPAA says you can't share anything, even that somebody is receiving services, without either an authorization in place or some exception that would allow you to make that disclosure. Um, let's say that you know if this were a, a 14 or 15-year-old receiving services, the 14 or 15-year-old would sign that authorization to allow that disclosure to the school. Um, if it were someone who was an elementary school student, it would be that parent or legal guardian who signs that. Um, the one thing to understand, though, is that anything that is released to the school, if the school records it in the school file, it is now subject to FERPA, and it is no longer subject to uh, HIPAA. Um, so when somebody is signing a release, um, they should understand that this that it may be uh, available to different people once it goes into the school file, um, and the and school should be thoughtful about how much they're recording in that sense. Um, so documenting that someone is receiving services is different than documenting that they're receiving services, listing what the diagnosis is, listing et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it is absolutely possible to do, and this is where, again, having those conversations ahead of time so everybody it has a general sense of how much is being disclosed and how we balance that delicate ban uh, balance between privacy and disclosure so that we're meeting all of our goals can be um, so important. Great. Um, I have one more coming in. There are lots of questions about will we be posting this information for people to re-reference, and I, we have recorded the webinar to post on our website. Um, and then, of course, most importantly, the primer is available on both websites. Um, I would uh, assure people, everyone that everything you're seeing in shorthand on these slides and that I'm saying right now is in a lot more uh, detail in the primer. So uh, the primer is uh, definitely the the resource to reference later on. For sure. And it um, includes and all the legal citations so that if folks want to then bring this back and talk to their own legal and administrative folks, the primer is a, a really nice resource in that sense too. Great. Um, here's another tricky one. Um, I'm a school district employee and supervise interns who see students for mental health counseling. If our counseling records are not part of a school database, because we keep clinical charts for our own records and to train interns in clinical documentation, these records would not be part of HIPAA or FERPA, correct? They are just considered, quote, unquote, personal notes? Um, so I can't provide legal advice, um, but I think that all I can say is you're on the right track in terms of asking those questions. So uh, again, the primer provides a bit more detail about any guidance that's available from the Federal Department of Education on sort of what is sole possession notes and what is not sole possession notes. Um, and uh, just trying to really keep track. It is often the case that we've got folks who may be um, school employees who are supervising folks who are technically, for example, employees or, or interns with a, a hospital or a county clinic, and that's where walking through what happens with information that gets recorded and sort of whose file it's under um, can be really 
helpful so that if it is, for example, FERPA, but it's a sole possession record, people understand that, or if it's um, because it was written by somebody who is not a school employee and who is clearly part of uh, an agency under HIPAA that, in fact, that, that should be kept separate and is a HIPAA record. Um, that all of that, can, it can be really valuable to map out in some sort of policy and protocol conversations uh, ahead of time. That makes a lot of sense. Um, we only have a few more minutes, but I got one more question in. Um, for a school-based provider, a contractor who works in the school writes IEPs and who is co normally covered under FERPA, they are asked by the parents um, for notes on the child's sessions. Is that therapist required to disclose all of the information they have, even though they would prefer to keep this information private? Um, all right, so I'm going to take one step away from that and say, if you have an um, educational record that is subject to FERPA, one of the goals in that the federal government had in writing FERPA was to ensure that parents could access records and so there really are not in FERPA the same, um, HIPAA has some exceptions that explicitly give providers discretion to hold back records if they think that disclosure might be detrimental, for example. Um, we didn't talk about it today, but HIPAA gives providers a bit more discretion to do that. FERPA doesn't have that written into FERPA, but if you talk to a school if you are ever in a situation where you think disclosure of something in an education record to a parent might put anyone at risk or, or uh, put a, someone in, in harm's way, then that is a time to contact legal counsel for the district or for the school and ask for advice um, because uh, you don't, yeah, that's all I'm going to say. The, especially for folks who work in schools or school districts or school employees, um, every school district and school does have legal counsel in some way or another and take advantage of that fact. Great. We did get one more, but it, it's broken up in the Q&A thing, so I'm trying to see if I can understand it. Um, we have a consent for release exchange of information um, with the local school for limited information like appointment information, and for when the child is referred off campus for emergency purposes. Um, we have the expir expiration date as their expected graduation date, um, but we also have a general statement stating that the consent is valid while the child is enrolled in the school district. Does this meet the HIPAA requirements? Well, this is easy for me because I can't provide legal advice. So I, uh, that is a kind of question that I can't answer, but I would encourage you to look at the primer and look at the list of requirements. And, that, and the primer is designed to then allow you to bring that kind of question to your own legal counsel to get a, um, an answer. And, and the primer can help support that by saying, here's the summary list. Does my actual form um, meet the requirements that are here? Well, great, that's perfect timing because that was the last question and we're at 2 o'clock. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much to all of you for joining us. I know you're all busy um, folks, so thanks for your hour and thank you especially to Rebecca for all of your expertise and trying to answer all of our questions. Um, we have up on the screen two different websites, the National Center for Youth Law as well as the California School-Based Health Alliance. Both of those websites have the primer, which as Rebecca um, referenced many times is a great storehouse of all this information and um, sort of walks you through all the different possible scenarios and then gets you as far as you can get without your own legal counsel. Um, and then just a reminder that uh, both Rebecca and I and the CSHA team will be in Redondo Beach in May and we hope to see you then. Um, Early Bird, I believe, goes one more month, so um, but the hotel is uh, getting booked up quickly. So register soon for Early Bird and get your hotel reservations and we hope to see you in May and feel free to reach out if you have any other questions or um, any other suggestions for future webinars or trainings. Thank you so much. Thank you.